Hey Dave, sorry about that, man. No problem. It was a Google plugin crash. I, I'm, I had to migrate over to Firefox. It's every time I try to do the Hangout in Chrome, it crashes. <laughs> I thought today was my lucky day. Uh, no. All right, we're almost all back. Um, Seems like it's being really slow today. Yeah, I, I'm having some problem on this end. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, but I think we'll be all right now. I'm just trying to involve a couple people that I, I should I invite Vic, can, uh, like the head yeah. of Google, yeah. just for fun? Yeah, yeah why, why not? All right. I've never yeah. talked to him in person. The one time I was in and hang out with him, it um. Oh wait, one sec here. The one time I was in a hangout with him, my my mic was muted and I didn't know it. <laughs> so I was like, I was trying to talk to him. I was like, wow, he must just think I'm totally uninteresting. He's not answering any questions. <laughs> um, Can you guys hear my mic? Okay, or should I get some headphones and plug them in? You're fine. Yeah, we can hear you well. All right, I think we're good to go. And I'm going to broadcast publicly. And we're live now. And all the invites are out. Hey, Jody made it. I did. You know, I got in just as soon as you dropped out, apparently. So. All right. Glad to see you made it. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay. So are you painting? Yeah, I'm going to do a little painting. Uh, let me post the itinerary on my stream just so everybody kind of knows what's up. Um, let me see if that will refresh. And then we can get on with it. Sorry about the delay. I, I just messaged uh, Paul. Did you re-invite him to this one? Ooh, no, not yet. I'll do it. Okay, I don't know if he got it, the message, but I just wanted to make sure. Do you see his article in Airbrush Magazine? It was pretty sweet. He posted on his wall about it, and then uh, yeah, yeah, he's cool. a man for sure, man. Yeah. Now, do you think people? Okay, there you go. You can see the public hangout finally on my stream. Um, And if anyone, I don't know how to do it. If anyone would want yeah, to throw it, throw in the link there, that'd be awesome. Thanks, Dave. All right. So for today's hangout, I wanted to be pretty quick about it. Maybe try to get it done in the next 40 minutes at the most. We'll try to even do it quicker than that. Uh, I thought I would first show you an illustration I was doing the other day that I made a kind of a brutal error on, but then tried to turn it into a positive. <clears throat> and then do a little painting demonstration, talk a little bit about the usefulness and detriment of tracing and some of the other auto assist features on digital painting and um, kind of talk through that while I'm working. And then we'll talk a little bit about some properties of light and then what the homework is for this week. And I'm not going to, the way that we're going to set it up, there's going to be no possible way to cheat. <laughs> All right, it's going to be like it's going to be hardcore this week. So, um, let me share my screen and we'll get right to it. Um, but first, All right, so quickly I wanted to share this first. This is a you know, uh, I work with a lot of youth and and teach them a lot about art. And one of the, I have this, this teacher assistant, and she has this really kind of um, big, big round eyes and kind of small features other than her eyes. So I was like, oh, this is going to be a fun drawing. So one day I didn't have too much to do, and she was just didn't have anything to do. So I was like, hey, kiddo, can I draw you? And so I, she sat down and started doing a sketch and got through to a certain point, uh, most of the eyes and the nose, and was about to put in the mouth and the chin and the jawline. And, and then she had to leave, and so I got 
I was like, oh, I, I've been kind of studying the model for the last 10 minutes. I can probably figure this out. Then I, I put the jawline in and I put up too high. And I, so what happened was, and you can see my cursor, right? Mm -hmm. So this jawline was too high. And then it left me no room to really develop the mouth where it should be. And, and what, I, what I did was I figured, okay, I screwed up the whole thing, right? This is pen and ink. There's no way back. This is not a digital piece. There's no erasing. There's no control Z. So what I did was I, I played off of my mistake and I exaggerated the roundness of her hair. And what I did was try to make this sweeping globe here. It's just very, very round feel. And then to kind of exa exaggerate that, I found some images of orange blossoms and I put some oranges and orange blossoms here to kind of repeat this, this circular theme. And then I found an image of a really fat little chickadee or some bird, right? And I made this whole composition just of repeated circles and, um, and uh, these, these little trios. Are, they're almost like quartets in a triangular fashion. I have this series of four dots here, but in a triangle fashion. And I have a series of uh, four dots here in a triangle shape. And then I did the same sort of triangulation in the leaf structure here, but it's, it's again four tufts of leaves but in a triangular shape. And so just try to work with this basic idea <clears throat> of repetition and variation, all based around this mistake that I made in the original illustration. <laughs> so I thought I would show you that because um, what I wanted to talk about today in general was mistakes. And um, I'm going to get into my ArtRage file and, and talk a little bit about mistakes because we had <clears throat> one of the most interesting posts from a student this week to me was um, a woman with, with a, a really good eye for the work. And the thing that for me was tough though about what she was doing is she's not really allowing herself to fail. And I, I think a huge part of being an artist is, is learning how to confront failure and, and to have some peace about it, right? Um, She's using a lot of the tracing features, and she's using a lot of the color picking features, even though there we had that kind of explicit, hey, don't use that color picker. It's cheating this week, right? But she couldn't get away from it and uh, because she was getting too frustrated with the failure or the difficulty. And I think there's, there's a, something very important to be said for um, finding, finding a lifeline when you're getting to that like rage quit moment, right? <laughs> so maybe is that, a, is that a Bobby Joe term right there? Um, I should have invited her. Did you guys see her illustration, by the way, that she did in MS Paint? Yeah. It was ridiculous. All right, I'm going to invite her real quick. She might just add a little spice to this. Um, all right, now she's invited. Uh, the thing that I, I love about art is the risk that it takes. You know, Every time you, you open up a new canvas, it's blank white. And it's just there's – you have no – guidelines you know it's completely naked to your mark to your mark and for me that is is joyful right this is an, an unbelievable opportunity I think if all we wanted to do is was have pretty pictures come out of the tip of our pen um, then we could just use the tracing feature and our rage has a tracing feature and I've never shown it to you guys because I would hate for you to use it and because of what you what you get with the tracing feature is you get nice looking stuff but you don't learn anything you might you might learn a little bit of confidence with the tools and, and, and to kind of see this, this tool kind of facilitate you creating something that is working. But I don't think that you learn anything about color, composition, proportion, value, you know, any of these things that make art art. And, and you don't even get to learn about line quality because uh, the whole thing is predetermined. And I'd say if you're going to trace something, you might as well let the computer do it. Right, because there's the auto trace features in a lot of these programs. So just do that. If you want, just want pretty pictures, let the computer make them. You can press print, you know, press Control P, and it's good to go. But I think that's a waste of everybody's time. Um, the point of all this is learning. You know, I asked one of my good friends. He's an artist, and he's at the Chicago Institute, doing his grad program out there. And you know, so it's one of the highest end grad programs in the country. And I said, I said, tell me in your words, why do you paint? Why do you create? He says, I do it to learn. And that's a, that's a fundamentally beautiful answer. You know, it's like, I do it to learn. And so I 100% agree. I work in order to learn. The way, I, I, learn, I, the way I, I understand the world is by creating in it. 
and seeing how these, you know, it's a sort of communication. It's sort of like uh, user interface design, you know, for those people that do that kind of thing for a living. When, um, hold on one second, let me change my tool. <clears throat> You know, when you when you push a button on user interface design and, and then the whole screen changes, what's happening is a sort of communication is you're creating an input and it's responding to you and there's a change that's made and then you go on forward with another sort of input and another change is made and so on and so on. That's amazing. That's the sort of communication. In a similar way, that's what we're doing with art, right? We're, we're experimenting with the hypothesis in a way it's like science, but it's also um, this sort of communication with the world. It's us reaching out saying, here's this idea I have, what do you think about it? And the world reaches back and says, ah, that's a stupid idea. Why don't you go try something else? Or the, or the world reaches back and says, oh, I like that idea. That's kind of beautiful. I haven't thought about that before. And there, you know, this is, that's when it becomes beautiful. Um, I think we have to let ourselves be scientists in a sense and have hypothesis and explore, explore and, and, and fail and go back to the drawing board. I think this is the beauty of it is there's, there's uh, like last week we were talking about the difference between traditional and digital is there's more risk in the traditional because there's no control Z uh, and and you know we just live with our mistakes in the digital there's already so many enabling tools that kind of just take the risk away um, so I think we need to just be judicious about how and and when and if we use them um, tonight what I wanted to do is start with this image here and I am going to use the color picker tool not because I want to make my life easy, but because I want to do it in the interest of time. Um, if I was doing this maybe on my own, I wouldn't use it, but for the sake of speed, I'm going to get going on this. Um, so everything good? You guys can hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Cool. What do you all think of that, what I was talking about with this whole risk and failure and the auto assist and all of that stuff? I think it's something that we, we all, as Americans, we all are afraid to fail and, and you hit the nail on the head. I mean, our education system teaches us not to fail, and uh, I think we go about it the wrong way. Because, like you said, failure brings education and experience, and experiences are more valuable than than most of the education that we receive. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think. Uh, so, what is the color picker? I didn't even know it existed. So, you gave me a, a tool that I didn't know there was. Oh, that's because you're awesome. You weren't even playing with it. The I color didn't even know there was. <laughs> <laughs> It's the middlemost tool on the innermost ring. Oh, okay. See, I don't have any trouble getting the right color, though, usually. I'm pretty yeah. good. Yeah. That, that's an amazing skill to develop. I mean, I think being a, an artist is, a, is, a, as, is like you kind of become the master of simple questions, right? Like I'm sitting here, and I'm like, okay, what color is that dark? That dark is brown dark. No, it's a green dark. Ah, why is it green? You know? And then you start asking yourself this, this long chain of ridiculously simple questions. Where does that red come from? Where, where is it, why is that reflected light orange? It doesn't make any sense. And then you start asking and asking and asking, and all of a sudden, all those simple questions learn to lead to some profound answers. And, um, and that's the beauty of it. But when you, when you just use all the auto assist, yeah, sure, you get a pretty, pretty image, but so what? You know? So what? It's sort of like Tim's question. Um, he, he was talking to Cliff, and he's like, what's the point of super realistic painting of a super realistic photograph? We already have the photograph, right? Um, what are you trying to learn? I think, and that's the ultimate question. What are you trying to learn? And in this picture, what I'm going to try to learn is, is a simple value study. I want to see if I can make this figurative stu study work. And I want to see if, if I can get my lights and darks to pop and if I can make this sort of unusual composition feel balanced, even though it's got a, a pretty asymmetrical balancing system in the composition. So first, I'm just going to start like I usually do. And I'm just going to knock in the general shapes. I want to find the sh general kind of tilt of the head here. And then I'm going to look at this line I put in for the window frame, then knock out the tilt of the shoulders, knock out the other shoulder, Maybe I have to adjust the size of the head. No big deal. We'll just do that now. Knock in where the other shoulder is. Come down for the chest. And just look at it as a simple shape, kind of like an old briefcase shape there, or like a bowling ball bag. And then the narrow part of the hips is just kind of a cylindrical object. We come down from there, and we would have the skirt that kind of opens out. Knowing the skirt exits the frame, just above this intersection here, this lower corner, 
and then this other part of the script goes this way. I feel like my proportions are a little bit off, but that's not too big of a deal. I'm going to zoom in and crop in on this just a little bit and just see what I, what I can do with that. Arm comes down at generally the angle of the shoulders. So the shoulders, though, are just a slight bit more. I'm going to do this with a pencil tool. Just a slight bit more like at this angle where the arm is coming down a little bit more like this angle. As an artist, I remember um, a, a, as a little kid artist, sometimes their teachers will have us do grid-based drawings. Did you guys ever do a grid-based drawing when you were in Munchkin school? Have you ever, and they, yeah. they have you, you grid it out and then do an enlargement? We actually did it on a wall. Okay. We did like an entire side of a grocery store. <laughs> oh, sweet. That's awesome. A little yeah. art installation or public art project. Yeah. That's sweet. Um, well, one of the benefits of that gridding process is it, it sort of teaches you, like for example, um, if I'm looking at the top edge of uh, this, this um, rightmost edge of her hair, is that the right side for you? Let's make sure the image isn't flipped. Um, yes. Okay, cool. Um, I can draw my eyes straight down from that point and I, and I can kind of find the reference for the highest point of the shoulder the in point. relation to the rightmost point of the hair. Or I can say, if I draw a line down right from the chin, I should run right into the angle or the corner of the dress where it, it, the vertical or the um, downward mark of the dress, or the inside of the collar, meets that horizontal line of the, of the line, the, what do you call that, the, the neck of the dress? What do you call that? I don't know. I don't know terminology around fashion. Um, <laughs> Neckline? Oh, yeah. yes. Uh, that makes all too much sense. Okay. <laughs> so, um, then I'm going to maybe put an indicator mark here for just a tilt of the head. Um, and what I was getting at with that grid line thing is that if you could imagine a series of grid lines across this, as an artist uh, who's drawn for you know 20 years of my life in a, in, a, in a kind of a dedicated sense, I almost see the world with a grid imposed over it. You know, I'm always looking for these linear relationships for how to find. Okay, well the arm is connected. There's how much space between the arm and the head. There's this much space between the. I can find a a line from the chin to this. I can find a line from the elbow. Is is the the point at which the there's some architecture on that chair she's sitting on, and I know the angle that, that it comes down from is at this angle. I know that there's a piece of the architecture of the building is kind of intersecting with her noggin right about here. I know that, um, you know, then I will, a, a simple perspective study will, will teach me the angle at which all these elements in the window kind of come out from behind her and behind this chair and so on and so on. So if I really wanted to get, in, get into it, I could do a nice illustration here with perfect perspective, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not interested in that. We talked about what we want to learn. And today, what I want to learn is about value. That's my favorite thing to learn about. So um, start with my darkest darks, as always. I'm going to use the brush settings I'm using right now. I have my thinner set at about 35%, the loading at 5% and my pressure at 24%. And what I'm trying to replicate with those settings is, and I'll show you over here, I'm just going to get the color of the, the bench, is the quick, how, see how quickly the brush runs out of paint? Um, what I'm trying to accomplish here is a little bit more realistic painting style where the brush runs out of paint and I have to go back and get more every time, just like I do with the real painting. Are you guys going to paint along with me, or are you guys going to just kind of hang out and we'll get this done real quick? Or what do you think? You I'm going to watch. Get it done real quick. Um, that yeah. should off really shortly. Okay. We can watch and we can follow along later at home. Okay. Cool. Well, um, in that case, I'll just keep it moving. Um, please feel free, free to, like, you know interrupt and hang out and we'll just have a casual conversation. But I was going to kind of keep jabbering while I'm working so that maybe there's a couple hints that come out of this that actually are meaningful to somebody along the way. And um, right now, I'm squinting. If you could see a screenshot of me instead of my, my, uh, my, my palette, what you'd see is me squinting. And what I'm really looking for is to reduce the detail at this point and just see the shapes of light and dark. And, it, you know, I always talk about this in terms of, uh, like, uh, in, in youth terms. I just love using the simplest examples. Um, if, if 
you know, if someone came into you, you know, when I was a kid, my mom used to always come to, into my room around the holidays and say, Daniel, fix this, you know, and she'd look at my horrible, messy room and say, Grandma's coming over, let's get this fixed, you know, and I would look at the room and I'd have no idea how to begin because it was such a disaster. And I would, um, you know, you use like you strategize like, all right, I'm gonna throw everything in the closet. Like, no, that didn't work last time. You know, and so you have to come up with a good solution. And, and when something is as overwhelming as that was to me as a kid, I remembered I just had to focus on one thing at a time. And a lot, a lot of painting is just the same. I use that analogy over and over. Um, what I'm focusing on right now by squinting is I don't want to see any stupid detail. All I want to see is the shapes of light and dark. I'm trying to get a feel, you know, almost like a gut feel for how this all fits together. I'm really just very, very curious about that. I'm letting my curiosity guide me. And the, the thing that I'm, I know that I have to get down here before I kind of understand what's going on is where all the big dark elements are. They're going to be, they're going to act almost like a skeletal structure for me to build the rest of the image around. And I, I can't tell you enough, like the messier you can be at this stage, the better. You want to be honest and have integrity, you know, say, uh, that was too light, I'm going to fix that, or that's not blue enough, I'm going to fix that. Um, and again, if I weren't using the color picker, I would be taking a little more time to mix the right color and so on, but just in the interest of time, I'm trying to bang this out. Um, I really like some of the things, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go no, you go ahead, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I really like some of the uh, attention you're paying uh, this whole hangout is is full of uh, a lot of information, so absolutely I'll be going back later on to uh, go back over this as Lightning was saying. Um, you were asking before about you know what we think about you know making mistakes and, and these kinds of things, and I think it's 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 crucial for the learning process. Um, I, somebody told me in a completely different or unrelated field. Um, a very simple statement that has meant the world, and it just a lot of the things that you're talking about seem to fit right in with it, which is just the idea of let success be your proof. In other words, make mistakes. You're gonna, it's going to happen anyways. Go ahead and accept that that's going to happen. That you're gonna learn from them, and when something works, it simply works. I mean, the universe has this way of letting you know that yeah. what you're doing is working. It's it's quote unquote successful. Um, if, whether it's making a pretty picture, you know, as you said, yeah. um, or cleaning your room. You know, you said yourself, you know, you tried this and this and strategize, and well, that didn't work. Well, you tried something else and it did. Yeah. And, you know, in future, I'll do that again because it worked. So um, I, I appreciate the, the advice that you're given, and it's, uh, it's being taken and filed away from my <laughs> own little strategies. <laughs> it's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, I, that's what I love about art is it's uh, so much experimentation and, and there's such, uh, such beautiful vulnerability in it, you know, um, because there isn't a right answer. You know, there, I think there are some very, very healthy processes, but there isn't like, oh, that's the right answer. You know what I mean? Uh, there's a little bit more room for envisioning, interpretation, experimentation, and... and uh, Another thing I love about it, the thing that just keeps me in constant pursuit, is that you never paint the master work. Um, it's always, you know, kind of that that el the beauty that you see in the world is elusive. You know, it's it's like you can't capture it. You have to catch it fresh every day, and and that's why you just keep going back to the canvas and find some, find more reason to paint is because. And where you ca where you caught the beauty yesterday, it doesn't exist anymore. You you, you see it in a new place. You know, and so. Um, it is a lifelong pursuit. You know that Michelangelo. Oh no, I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah, I want to save that for next, <laughs> next, next time. I want to <laughs> talk about that next time. But um, I, I work sometimes, with, like I said, with youth, and and a lot of times they struggle with boredom. You know, and I say, guys, I've never been. I haven't been bored since I can remember. And they say, no way. You know, I was. And, and we get into this fun discussion. And I said, no, seriously. I remember almost being bored in math class in high school, but then I picked up my sketchbook, and I would do, I would use that hour and a half to doodle, you know, because you know the teacher would always well, she would start out with like you know the here's the first outside inside last or whatever foil you know, you're doing factorials or something I haven't taken math since I was like 16, but um, 
but I remember, you know, you'd, you'd learn it in the first five minutes of class, and then the teacher would spend the, the latter 45 minutes of the class, the last hour of the class, trying to dree teach to the mouth-breathing kid in the back, you know, who couldn't give, <laughs> couldn't give a, a crap what was going on, you know, and the rest of us sitting there with our, about to poke our eyes out with our pencils. And it was art that saved me in school, and it's, it's art that saved me in life because I've, with art, you never are bored. You're always, there's always something to look at, you know. Um, whether it's like just a simple exploration of value or you're interested in the patterning of some pattern relationship between some architectural element and some organic element or whatever it is, the mind is always alert when, when engaged in art. And I think the fundamental premise of it all is that the more I work, the more sensitive I become, you know, the more alert my senses are, which is really a beautiful thing because then... Uh, life gets more and more and more enriched the more and more and more we work. And, and kind of like what Michael was saying, the, um, the success will come. I, I, I've never even thought that far ahead. <laughs> like, sometimes I just think it almost doesn't matter if it comes, you know. Uh, it would be awesome if it does. But it, it's, it's like... Secondary. Yeah, the the act itself is is what it's is what's make what makes it all worthwhile. And it's it, sort of like I had a friend of mine say, we used to believe that if if we did what we love, the money would follow. Now we believe that if we do what we love, it, it the rest doesn't matter. You know, or the he said if we do what we love, the money doesn't matter. And and, and I think maybe that's a bit optimistic, but I think there's a truth to it. When I'm painting, I honestly forget about everything else. And um, I think when we're living our creative lives, this, that's what it feels like. But in the in the you know, on the other hand, we do have to pay the bills, right? So, <laughs> so we 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 do what we got to do. Well, there's some, a piece of that that actually I have a question um, or a, a problem that I've run into in the past, where on the one hand, there's nothing like being in that zone, you know, where you're just so totally absorbed in the work and. and you know, time just flies by, and you know, you know, there's nothing else it really exists other than what you're working on, and it's it's a beautiful place to be in, and it's, it's enormously productive and creative. But I, I found that for myself, uh, it's one thing to get into that, but it, taken almost too far. I don't know if it's too far, but get yeah. too obsessed with the details. Um, and one of the things I'm noticing as you're working here is, say, for instance, you're just blocking things in, as you said, and, and don't worry so much about every little detail of it. Um, but I just, as you were blocking in the, the neckline there with the dress, you put this, like, you switched over and made this quick little splotch of brown for the shadow just over, over the top of the neckline. And for me, that would, that would be a killer. I, w I would do that, and then I'd want to get into all these other little details and all these other little spots of color. And I've gone way off track from just trying to block things in. Uh, do you have any kind of like, how to go from being so focused on the detail to jumping back out to saying, okay, I'm just, I'm just blocking things in? I think that's a great question. Here's my, my process with that is that as I'm working, I'm thinking, my thought process is, I'm trying to understand this shape. I'm trying to understand this value. Well, I need that tiny little detail to understand if I have, like that little dark right there at the, at the neckline. I'm trying to figure out if I have, you know, all this skin tone right, right across the chest. I can't tell if that's the right skin tone until I have that dark in place. And, and so it's just basically the questions that are guiding me. Like, Is that right? I can't tell. I've got to get the other parts in there. Um, and, and so it's simply just my curiosity about, about the the big picture that almost necessitated that tiny little ad adventure into the detail just because for that part of the image I needed to understand a little bit more than I was getting with the broad strokes. So it just all falls in line with that general line of questioning. Like in relation and context. Yeah, yeah. And then for that particular point, um, I'm still not trying to resolve anything. I'm just still trying to understand what I'm doing. And I think that... Um, like being led by curiosity is is a wonderfully freeing thing, um, as opposed to being led by results. Um, because when 
as soon as our identity and ego gets wrapped up into, oh man, I hope nobody sees this. I want, I don't want anyone to see this till it's good, you know. Um, then we've got a problem because we're we're producing uh, for. And we've we've got judgment laying heavy on our mind even before you know, just as we've even begun. Um, and if we can approach stuff instead, like uh, I'm just curious about that. What happens over here? I don't know. Let's go see. You know, if you have that kind of line of questioning, then there's just total freedom in your work. One time, I had this uh, girlfriend, and and she and I were talking, and I said, "Do you want to? Would you rather have a success?" Oh God, how did I say it to her? I was asking her about relationship, and I said, you know, most people say that they want success in their relationships. They want to have a successful relationship. But what's the difference between saying, I want to have a su successful relationship, and I just want to learn to understand my partner? And there's, like, one obviously very process-oriented, and the other one's very, like, uh, goal-oriented. But, you know, you say, well, what's wrong with wanting a successful relationship? That's a good thing, right? But the, in the, the actions that flow from that, desire for success or, well, I have this picture of what success looks like in my mind and, and we need to at attain this sort of uh, intimacy and if we don't have that sort of intimacy then we're not succeeding and all of a sudden I feel like a failure and da da da. But the line of questioning that falls from I just want to learn to know my partner or my lover or whatever, right? The, 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 the uh, ideas that flow from that are, are a totally different line of questions and ultimately lead you to the, the desired goal. So, you know, at least that at least lead to your partner's happiness. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know. Is that does that make sense? Is that too esoteric? Or no, it's fine. It's fine. But, but I, yeah, I think relationships are probably the best analogy for how artwork happens because uh, all of art is relationships. You know, it's just this. Right now, I'm studying value relationships. Later, I'll be studying textual relationships and maybe spatial relationships. But it's all about how one thing impacts another. When you're doing a painting in a traditional fashion, you have this kind of saturation in, in that line of, or in that uh, series of relationship-driven questions. Um, you're, when you can't use the color picker, you're trying to say, well, wow, that value really pops. Why does it pop? It doesn't look like it's that contrasty. And then you start to get into it, and all of a sudden you realize it's not that it's it's this particular part of the painting that's contrasty. It's that part of the painting in relation to this other part of the painting. And then all of a sudden, you come to, it comes to life, and you say, oh, oh, and I get it, I get it. And then, and then you resolve it, and it's very beautiful, it's fun, you know. So I think that's the, that's why uh, I always end up talking about relationships when I'm talking about art. But and in this digital stuff, it's sort of decontextualized a little bit because you're just like, oh, I don't need to really worry. I just use the color picker and grab the color. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's not as much need for study and, and curiosity, but uh, it's still there, you know. And I think that one of the, that's why I've been advocating that sort of moving away from some of these um, auto assist tools just for the learning phase. Um, I know you said something about wanting to uh, discuss uh, tracing and, and those sorts of things. In this. Yeah, and, and tracing is probably the, the worst offender as far as just taking the opportunity to learn away from the, the artist. It's just, like I say, it's, that's the, the most gross example of being product-oriented. And, you know, like I say, there's something to be said for, you know, having a beautiful product. And we, we've, we've got to kind of, some we really sometimes got to have that, and there's nothing more satisfying as... Pull it, putting that last mark on the canvas and, and it's just this stunning thing and we're just so excited, you know. But I think it's how we get there that's the most important part. And um, and I think, you know, maybe use the trace tool once and just feel happy like that you can know digital painting can be a successful ven venture. Uh, but after that, you know, put it away and, and never use it unless you get like a call from some publisher that says, hey, I need this illustration in 10 minutes. <laughs> and then you're like, all right, I'm using the trace tool. <laughs> but but uh, other than that, I wouldn't touch the thing. Um, right now, I'm going to get into some detail and just get my tiny brush. And I just want to sort of see if I can get a feel for what the eyes would look like here. Um, I'm going to zoom out. And it looks cheese ball -y. You know, it looks kind of stupid. But it's like, yeah, it's all right. We'll, fig we'll fix it later. Um, one habit I have when I'm painting, whether it's digital or otherwise, is I use the biggest brush I can possibly use, I can possibly stand using, 
at all times. And the reason that is 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 then I don't get to fiddle too much or tickle the canvas too much. I just I just I've got to be intentional and bold and just get it done, you know. Oh, Mike, so what's up? Hey guys, how's it going? It's going good. Hey. I've, I've just been talking pretty much for a half hour straight, which is ridiculous. But other than that, it's good. <laughs> I think that was a great tip uh, about using the large brush. That was I think that was a fantastic tip, actually. Oh, sweet. Yeah, it keeps temptation at bay. <laughs> And and if nothing else, it gives you a, your work a sense of bravado, you know. And and if you can do something confidently, like how often have we seen somebody do something that's pretty stupid, but they do it confidently, so you're like, huh, they must know what they're doing, you know. And <laughs> I, I think there's something to that in painting too. You're like, well, that brushstroke is friggin' beautiful. It's totally in the wrong place, but maybe they know what they're doing. Or maybe I just don't get it. And you know, it, and that happens. And sometimes the artist totally screwed up, but. They did it so confidently that we just play along. Happy accidents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they're tragic accidents that we all play along with because it just looks so confident. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I mean, how often have we seen that in life? You know, some, you're like, dude, that guy is an idiot, but they are so confidently an idiot that <laughs> you're just like, well, let's just let them do it because it's almost awesome. <laughs> it's, like, it's not awesome, but it's almost awesome. It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah like, it's, it's, I just want to keep watching. It's uh, what it's makes you <laughs> crane your neck as you drive by a car wreck. You, know? so, you get into politics, right? Yeah, I didn't <laughs> want to go there, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we just... But it's, it's, very it's about there. that season, isn't it? Uh, it's awesome. No, you're making very good points uh, about uh, kind of what, the kind of work you're doing here. Um, Using broad strokes and being process oriented, you know, uh, enjoying the work for the work itself. Um, now, coming from to this kind of work every once in a while, you know, because y y as much as I love this process and I love painting, I still want to, like, you know, sometimes the, the right thing, the call of my heart is like, yeah, I, I want to be super anal and just kind of dig into some ridiculous detail today. So then I go pick up, you know, some pen and ink and I draw some, like, I don't know, I draw some pile of roses, you know, and just make myself go insane with the detail. But sometimes, you know, sometimes that's fun and sometimes it's the right thing. Um, but I think even even when you're doing that kind of work, uh, the, in the planning phase of something like that, you still kind of are working in a broad, um, abstract kind of idea of like generally here's my light areas, generally here's my dark areas. The reason this composition works is because dot, 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 you know. And and then maybe the, the the actual practice of the creative process is very exacting and refined. But um, at some point, there's always that kind of abs like larger kind of vision that's driving it. That kind of I think there's always some big picture view that that goes into even the most refined process. Or would you? I mean, have you found that in your work? Well, actually, I mean, my work currently, I'm. I'm uh, purchasing agent, so no, not really. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I do relate to what you're talking about, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I guess what I was talking about is more specifically uh, like engineering design and drafting. Oh, so the yeah. big picture is more like um, an engineer, engineer comes to you with these requirements. I need you know this widget, widget to have yeah. these particular functions and maybe have these very specific dimensions. Now, mm -hmm. make that. Um, yeah. And I think there there may be some, but a lot of times it, it starts from a very uh, well. It, it starts with math, yeah. you know, calculating all those dimensions. So there's not a lot of room for playing around with it. Maybe later you can see that uh, after you've designed something in in, in CAD or something that uh, there might be a uh, a better way to design a particular function. Um, but I, I think ultimately, as, as a designer, as, as well as an artist, we do well to counterbalance the two. You know, there, to me, at least, that's the way I kind of see it. Like I said, the, the drafting is more uh, about the technical design. And it, it's totally representative of that goal-oriented kind of thinking, whereas uh, uh, this kind of painting, like, we're all here to uh, 
uh, learn more about and develop with ourselves is this, um, I don't want to say broader, but more process oriented, where it's, it's about the, that exploration and curiosity. And, and I think that you find much more personal and individual expression through something like this. Yes. As you talk, it reminds me, um, my mentor, when his first job out of the university, when he, he went to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, which at the time was the top school in the country for art, and and he said the first job he had when he got out of school was to be um, an animator of Saturday morning cartoons. He and he said there were two jobs in there in that studio. One was the guy that would draw the storyboards, and the other guy would ink the drawings, ink the storyboard work, basically. So you had the one guy who was the envisioner, and the other guy was, that was the ex executor, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I, it sounds to me like a lot of the the CAD work that you're talking about is it's just you're executing the plan. The plan has already been put in place. The envisioning's long done, and they just need someone to build. Exactly. And, and I think that there are those jobs in art as well. You know, there's the person who's like, I'm just the line art dude who who makes the sweet looking line on top of the uh, person that composes the illustrations, illustrations, you know. And so I, I think there's a place for, for that in all industry. Uh, I, I just personally, I want to be the concept artist instead of the, the guy that goes and does the exacting detail that, you know, follows the concept artist around. I want to be the guy that's like, wouldn't it be cool if uh, this is how it looked? And, you know, you're just dreaming big. That's, that's my kind of art, <laughs> you know. Um, I've never been good at being the other guy. Okay. Yeah. Um, real quick. Just, in, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just like uh, I was talking about. Uh, yeah, generally I, I tend to think in broad strokes, kind of like what you're talking about. It's those were my thoughts are always about these ideas and exploring all these esoteric notions and seeing how things uh, fit together in ways that maybe we don't normally notice. Um, but for whatever reason, you know. It, 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 in my life, I, I've found myself in the position of being that guy that mm -hmm. follows around and does the takes care of the technical details and the little things here and the little things there. And then. yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's great because I see these two different perspectives at play. But uh, at this point, I, you know, I want to explore those broad ideas, kind of what you're saying. It's like I want to be the one that's coming up. And going, what if we did this? Yeah, yeah. So I'm here. To, I'm going to actually mute my mic here in a second because I'm here to learn from you, not to <laughs> talk over everyone. No, it's cool. I love the conversation. That's how it's fun for me, too. Um, the, what I did just real quick, though, is technically I didn't want to fuss with too much detail on this, this uh, tutorial and make you guys bored. So I created a new layer, and then I just took one of my very mid-tone gray beige colors, and I, I'm just you kind of putting it in, all in all over the place in the layer behind. And... I'm basically getting rid of a lot of my white areas that I hadn't yet covered in. And this is just a quick way take pick from the local color on the top layer and then just fill it in with big broad strokes so I don't have to worry about being careful. And where I my mark will kind of penetrate other areas and, and fill in and spill into other color zones, I think that's almost for the better. Um, it, I almost like a little bit of like, see, I'm just taking some of that, um, it's like Adobe red color and I just kind of knocked it in into that shadow and that puts a little bit of light into that shadow, makes that shadow feel like it's a little bit more permeable and it's got a little bit of light bouncing around in it. I'm going to also put a little bit of light in this area, that red color. It's going to warm some of the tones that I'm working in. I'm probably going to also take this green color and warm it up a little bit, add a little yellow to it, add a little bit more highlight to it, and then I just get a, a little bit more variety in this background area. And I'll come back to this and work on that later. But for now, I think it's giving me a good general sense of what's going on. Um, the other thing I just feel like isn't quite working is this, this value over here doesn't feel dark enough behind the girl. So I'm going to get a little darker dark than I have and try to capture a little bit deeper value. And then I want to use the palette knife tool and just sort of knock that in a little bit too big there and just kind of see what works. I think for now, what I would say right now, the drawing is at the stage that I can actually start painting. Because what I've done is I've basically established all the value and color relationships and proportional relationships. 
and now it's time to actually begin painting and and that is refining my edge quality, making soft, hard, and lost edges, refining my, my tones, my values, and making sure that the darks are dark enough, the lights are light enough, and the pop it has enough pop and contrast where those lights and darks meet. Um, and then also dealing with texture and proportion, and like her face is all kind of, it looks like a cartoon, you know, right now. And I really want to make it look good, and I want to make it look beautiful, and I want to have the soft light pooling. Uh, down around the mask and around the forehead and the nose and then the eye sockets and that I really want to get right but I want to do it in such a way that it it doesn't become like fine portraiture it remains a drawing of of the light more than it is a drawing that is this girl at this particular moment in time because I think th in finishing this piece I could make it a portrait drawing, and then all you would look at is her face. You know, you'd say, "Oh, I just want to look at the face." But I don't want people to just look at her face. I want them to look at the total, the the complexity of the light, all the texture and pattern of the glass block behind her, and the wood in the foreground, and then her dress. I want them to see all that. And I want them to see it all at once, and I want them to read it as this very kind of impressionistic scene of light on figure, light in space, light in uh, bouncing all around a scene, as opposed to here's a portrait of a girl wearing a mask. And so my intention, the question that's guiding me is, how do I communicate this feeling of light? And, and yeah, I want to refine the face a little bit, but I don't want to tighten it up so much that it becomes portraiture. So I'm becoming redundant, but that's kind of the idea here. Um, and I'll probably stop right now because we're, we're pretty close to our hour mark or 45-minute mark. But what I'll do is either finish this um, in a recorded session and put it up on YouTube, or I'll do it in the next Hangout that we do together. Um, but for now, it, I would call this step one of the painting, you know, generally, the first chapter. And then chapter two is that whole refinement and making that quality of light come to life and, and getting the proportion right and, and really making it pop. Some of the things that I do in that next session, just as a preview, is there's all these wonderful little highlights that, that have all kinds of uh, gradation and, and shift. It's a very modeled surface across the arm. And um, let me point to that. I'll just make circles so you can see it in the Hangout. Like, uh, let me see. There's all this complexity going on with the way that the light is traveling across the arm. And here, there's a, all kinds of wonderful texture happening here that I would want to play with. There's also um, sort of proportional issues that I want to resolve here. I obviously want to paint the hand. <laughs> so, um, and then I would like to play with the textures that are happening right there and all along the black glass block. And I probably want to accentuate a little bit more than I have even the red that's here and use it as a unifying color there, 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 and even a little bit in this part of the bench. And then obviously in the flower on, on the top of red. So that's some color stuff I'm going to pick up <coughs> for a little repetition. And then some texture stuff on the dress, some value stuff overall, proportion stuff on the face, and then call it, probably call it good. So that would be our session for today. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do is, like, if anyone else wants to hang out, I'm just getting started, man. I had a long day. I finally got home ready to paint. So if anyone wants to hang out, not, not necessarily, like, watch me paint or anything, but just to just have a hangout and just goof around, um, I'll just make another hangout after this. I won't put it on there, and we can just kind of talk shop. But thank you all for coming. You guys are the best. Your homework this week, are you ready for this? Uh, I haven't even finished last week's. Yeah, th this one's the I one. I haven't finished the last one. <laughs> I just guys, started the pair. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are the best. I don't feel bad about it, you know what I mean? We're, we're having fun. It's all right. But this one's going to be good. This one's going to be good. Um, find a, a cylinder in your house, whether a tennis ball, a golf ball, something, right? Put a, a strong single directional light, you know, one direction light source on it. Put it on a, on a tabletop or a TV tray or something next to your workstation where you, where you can paint. And paint it from life. Paint that ball, that cylinder, whatever, you, or, I mean that sphere, whatever, whatever kind of spherical object you can find and paint it with one light source on it. And, and when you do it, Look for lights, darks, midtones, but really especially look for the reflected light that's bouncing back up into that sphere, into that shadow. And, that, and you're going to find that the darkest dark in your illustration is going to be almost where the highlight meets the shadow. 
and you'll find that there's a lighter part of the shadow behind that shadow in the back, and that's going to be where the reflected light is. And it's that dynamic that's going to make your, your sphere feel round. And if you can accomplish this, you are going to feel incredibly joyful. I mean, this is, this is an awesome thing. I do this all the time, you know, with, with intro students of all ages, of all levels. We, say we, we do this little study. Here's, here's, how, here's how light works. Here's the reflected light. Here's cast shadow, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to even talk to you about the kind of um, terminology. I just think study it. Look at the darks. Look at the values. Look at the highlights. Squint down and look for that reflected light and draw what you see. Now that you're comfortable enough with the tool because you've all done your homework, <laughs> <laughs> now you're ready for the, for the big stuff. And I think this will be the most telling assignment of all. And like uh, Scott was talking about last week, when we as photographers or we as designers or we as painters or we as just people learn to learn to look more closely at the world around us, it makes us better at whatever we do. And this is going to be one of those things that it's a stupid little cylinder. I love stupid little projects because you have, there's no excuse, right? You can't hide and say, oh, oh it was just really complicated. The, the flower petals, they're too complicated. I can't draw. No, it's a stupid cylinder, right? We know what this looks like. So you have this dumb little assignment. <laughs> but it's not about the dumb little object. It's about the complex and beautiful properties of light that make it feel round. And if you can make this stupid little s sphere feel round, then we can graduate on to painting the cool stuff, you know, like making this, this young woman in the illustration I'm working on right now, making her face feel round or making her leg feel voluminous or making, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You see the, the, where we're going with this. So the fun stuff follows from the stupid stuff. And the final quote from the day is, what is it from, uh, what does Einstein say? Is that I want to do great and wonderful things, but before I do them, I must learn to love the little things like they were great and wonderful. It's like my favorite quote of all. And um, it's, this is the truth, right? Like, let's fall in love with this stupid little stuff, and the world will come alive before our eyes. So um, that's all I got. You guys are the best. I talked more than I talk ever. I feel ridiculous <laughs> about it, but so it goes. Um, at least you didn't have to pay for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got such a wealth of knowledge that you're sharing with all, with all of us. To you, you just feel like you're just rambling on. But, I mean, I don't know about all the rest of you guys here in the hangout, but I'm, I'm just, like, sucking it all up. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I eat it up. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, you guys, you're nice. You're very nice. <laughs> um, well, hey, um, I'm going to make a new hangout because i got a couple of questions for you if you guys are curious, so just to goof around a little bit. So I'm going to close off the uh, official broadcast, and, and maybe we'll see you in a sec. Thanks again. All right. Thank all you, right. Daniel. Take care. Okay. See you. Bye.